It's an, an honor to have a chance to introduce our first speaker and our keynote speaker today, Dr. Lisa Cooper. Uh, Dr. Cooper is one of the first scientists to document disparities in the quality of relationships between physicians and patients from socially at-risk groups. She also designed innovative interventions targeting physicians' communication skills, patients' self-management skills, and healthcare organizations' ability to address the needs of populations experiencing health disparities. The research has led to over 180 publications, and she's been a principal investigator in more than 15 federal and private foundation grants. Here at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Cooper directs the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity, where she and her transdisciplinary team work with stakeholders from healthcare and the community to in implement rigorous clinical trials, identifying interventions that alleviate racial and income disparities in social determinants and health outcomes. Dr. Cooper has received several honors for pioneering research, teaching, and mentoring, including being named a member of the National Academy of Medicine, a 2007 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, and a Fellow of the American College of Physicians. She's also been recognized by several community organizations for her community engagement and advocacy to address health disparities. Her talk today is entitled, The Role of Research in Advancing Health Equity, Calling for a Bold New Vision. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Cooper, I will turn it over to you and welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. And um, I'm, I'm so enthusiastic and um, excited that you chose this topic uh, to focus on for your workshop today, um, because it's so close to my heart. And as we all know, something that is really um, a critical issue uh, at this time. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully all of that will go well. Uh, let's see. Just trying to do that, start that slideshow. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see me. Yeah, see that and very well. Thank you. My slides as well. All right. So um, as uh, as Greg just mentioned, or I was it Ilya or Greg that just mentioned my talk is on the role of research in advancing health equity, calling for a bold new vision. And the objectives for the talk today are first to, to discuss some key definitions, frameworks, and scientific disciplines that inform health disparities research, then discuss gaps in evidence and highlight some transdisciplinary research methods that are have been used in intervention studies using some examples from uh, the Center for Health Equity. Uh, and then finally, to provide recommendations for advancing health equity through research that informs implementation uh, as well as evaluation of practices and policies. So first of all, what are health disparities? Um, there are several definitions of health disparities, but they are preventable differences in the burden of disease injury or violence or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. Another definition states that they are the unfair and avoidable differences in health status that are seen within and between countries. And as you all know, these disparities result from complex interactions among multiple factors that are differentially distributed across groups of people. And although genetic and biologic factors and individual behaviors are important, the behavioral choices that people make are often shaped by the choices they have. So a health disparity is inequitable if it's systematically associated with, with social disadvantage in such a way that it puts a disadvantaged social group at further disadvantage. So, and we, as we know in this country, as well as in other places throughout the world, disparities in health are often rooted in inequities in the opportunities and resources that people need to be healthier, which are unjust social structures. So these determinants include things like living and working conditions, education, income, um, neighborhood characteristics, social inclusion, for example, in the political process and medical care. So there are many different pathways uh, that differ from one subpopulation to the other, um, as uh, do the nature of the interactions. 
So we can't sort of apply a one uh, size fits all uh, approach to health inequities. Uh, it, it really depends a lot on context and uh, historical and social context. Now, on the other hand, uh, what our vision is, is health equity, and that is the absence of systematic disparities in health or its social determinants between more and less uh, social, socially advantaged groups. So um, if we have health equity, we actually have the absence of systematic disparities, and these social determinants of health are actually shaped by uh, things like wealth, power, and prestige. So in order to operationalize this, this definition, we really need to, to define what the highest standard of health is. And uh, that is typically of the most advantaged group within a society. And then we usually compare um, you know, the, the groups, other groups in, to, in society to that more advantaged group. We really need to remember that in doing that, we're sort of framing this as, um, as somehow uh, people who have health inequities being less than or different from some standard. And so we really need to remember like the fact that the standard is only there because of those historical and, uh, and political structures that are in place and that it doesn't necessarily imply that that group is, is the standard that should, you know, should be the standard. Um, so, you know, the World Health Organization says that uh, health equity is when every person has a fair opportunity to attain his or her full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from that because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. Now, there are numerous conceptual frameworks for, um, for health uh, disparities and health equity. This is one of the more um, well-known ones that comes from uh, the WHO report on social determinants of health. This one in particular focused on policy and practice and framed health as a social phenomenon and then basically included numerous frameworks that, that really seek to explain the social production of health. So it shows how all these social, economic, and political mechanisms give rise to socioeconomic positions uh, and, then, and then several social groups are stratified uh, according to these different um, to these factors that then differentially um, expose them to material circumstances and lead to different behaviors and psychosocial factors that then determine their ultimate health. The newest um, framework that uh, came out of WHO uh, came from uh, the Pan American Health Organization uh, equity and uh, health inequities uh, conceptual framework that was published in 2018. And the main difference um, in this framework, it's really based on the previous one. The main difference is on that it focuses on the health of disadvantaged populations in the Americas, including African Americans and Native Americans. And it really shows a, a strong focus on looking at history and the legacy of ongoing colonialism and structural racism. Um, and then also frames um, the outcomes of interest as not only health equity, but also the um, opportunity to live a dignified life. And it focuses on the fact that taking action on health uh, disparities involves changes in governance and in human using of human rights approaches. So where does research come into all of this? Well, one thing we've known is that we've actually used research to document health disparities for many decades and health disparities are widespread. Um, their impact uh, and effects on mortality, quality of life, and costs affect us all. And you know, national data in the United States really reveals a lack of progress on health equity in the U.S. over the past 25 years, whether we look at uh, inequities uh, based on race, ethnicity, or income. And uh, sadly, as we all know now, COVID-19 has shown a, a very bright light on existing health disparities and actually magnified them. So we look at this, this familiar map uh, for many of us who study health disparities here in Baltimore to really show that in fact, uh, health is really determined by, um, by place. So here in Baltimore, there's only uh, in between neighborhoods that are only five miles apart, we see stark differences in life expectancy, a 20 year gap to be precise between Roland Park and Madison East End where uh, Johns Hopkins is. And you, you can see the differences in the socioeconomic makeup of the, of the population in those two neighborhoods 
with Roland Park being predominantly white, uh, the income being about three times that of the income, uh, average household income in Madison East End, unemployment uh, generally being much lower um, there and homicide rates being about a 10th of what they are in Madison East End. So you can see these maps could be replicated basically for any, any urban area across the entire United States. And um, you know we see similar uh, statistics in, even in uh, other countries in, in Western Europe, for example. So the one thing that I knew when I uh, completed my medical training was that there were many paths that, that could lead to health equity. I was really interested in that because of my, my own experiences growing up in Africa and um, you know, coming from a, a middle class, uh, upper middle class family, but being really surrounded by a lot of people who were experiencing extreme poverty and, and poor opportunities to be healthy. Um, I wanted to become a clinician but I also knew that uh, seeing one patient at a time might not really be enough to put a dent in the problem. So there are so many different methods um, of, of being engaged in health equity uh, work and um, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by colleagues who are committed uh, in the practice realm, in the educational realm, in the administrative realm policy, as well as uh, people who are involved in community activism and advocacy. Um, as many of you know, uh, and have chosen as well, I chose a research path because I really wanted to understand more about this problem, unpack it further, because um, it seemed to me that one of the main reasons we weren't making any progress was because we really just didn't have a good understanding uh, or a good sort of dis description of what these different issues were. And, and there are so many different approaches, even within research. Basic biomedical research could be done to to basically try to understand um, factors on a biological level, but uh, clinical and population research is where I wanted to, to focus. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today is sort of more along the, more about clinical and population research than about uh, the other types of research. So I wanted to share with you that the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, underwent a, a visioning process uh, in 2015, and they developed their research framework on health disparities. And you can see here that it's organized into different domains of influence. Uh, if, you, if you remember, um, the, we talked about the fact that there are multiple factors that contribute to health disparities and that they occur at multiple levels. So you can see here that they divided it into the domains of influence, but then they also looked at levels of influence um, and so, um, you know, we could talk about any one of these domains or any one of these levels of influence as a complete lecture in and of itself. But the point is just to let you know that, that to give you sort of an organizing framework and you can sort of try to see how your work, your research fits into this or for your particular problem that you're studying, which of these levels of influence or which of these domains of influence would you want to sort of focus on? It doesn't mean that you wouldn't look at some of these other things because as we know, they all sort of interact with one another, but you might be able to use this to help determine that. So for me as a clinician, I, I was very much interested in the domain of the healthcare system and its role. Um, I was also interested in behavioral factors because uh, one of the things that I noticed was that the patients I saw had um, a challenges with being able to make behavior changes that would help them be healthy. Um, and, then, um, and then I was really interested in individual level factors. So like patient attitudes and um, you know, preferences and things like that. But I was also interested in the interpersonal aspects uh, in the patient clinician relationship and in decision-making. So that's where I initially started out and then quickly learned that of course, these things don't exist in isolation and that it's really important to sort of capture some of the other factors that are part of the context that make, uh, that, that sort of interact with these other factors and, and might need to be understood and intervened upon as well if, if one was actually to affect change. So um, to do, to, to equip myself uh, to, to do this, I spent a lot of time uh, garnering knowledge and skills in the area of social epidemiology and I don't need to read this slide for you. I know many of you uh, are, are quite familiar with uh, what social epidemiology does, 
but you know because it focuses on social factors and the influence of those factors on health it is particularly a critical discipline uh, for health disparities research. Um, the other area in which I really uh, developed a lot of knowledge and skills was in the area of health services research, which really I needed to do because I was looking at these health system factors and, and you know, uh, interactions within the healthcare system. So, um, so health disparities research draws upon social epidemiology, it draws upon health services research methods um, and some of my early work focused on communication between doctors and patients of uh, different racial and ethnic groups and really was a descriptive set of studies looking at how doctors and patients relate with one another, how they communicate with one another, and basically found that that communication did differ in the visits of minority and white patients with physicians not communicating as clearly, being more dominant sounding less friendly, uh, focusing less on the psychosocial domain and more strictly on the, the medical, biomedical agenda. Uh, and that it, that it actually did matter what the race or ethnicity of the clinician was. So um, when there was shared background, race concordance, visits were longer, doc doctors and patients actually sounded happier. There was more involvement by patients in decision-making and uh, better uh, outcomes. And uh, that a lot of this research has actually grown over the years. And the most recent study actually showing that um, newborns taken care of by uh, race concordant clinicians have better outcomes than those uh, seen by race discordant clinicians. So uh, the area and other area I moved into because I knew that it wasn't all about um, what people did, but because a lot of these clinicians didn't purposefully do, you know, go into medicine so that they could discriminate against patients of color. I wanted to understand what was behind that and followed that up with actually uh, working with social psychologists to do a study on implicit race bias and did a, another cross-sectional study, which was, I would say, a descriptive and a mechanistic study where we looked at implicit racial bias and stereotyping using online tests uh, that have been developed by social psychologists, the implicit association tests that I'm sure many people are familiar with now, um, and actually found that about 70% of the primary care clinicians in our study, similar to the general population, had an implicit bias that favored whites over blacks, and an implicit stereotype that whites would be more medically compliant than, than black patients and that those attitudes actually were associated with poor communication behaviors in the visits of African-American patients. So, you know, I think the early work was sort of descriptive, looking at, um, you know, attitudes, behaviors uh, of clinicians and patients and how that might be contributing to, to disparities in outcomes. But pretty quickly it became uh, apparent to me that it wasn't gonna be okay to continue to study and describe disparities and talk about mechanisms for them, but then really begin to take action because of the extreme suffering that uh, I was seeing in the communities uh, that I was taking care of. And I knew that this was going on across the country. And so I, I began to learn more about clinical trials methodology. And so again, clinical trials uh, methods are very important in health uh, equity research. Um, a whole variety of different types of, int of, of clinical trials are important all the way from mechanistic and exploratory trials, uh, behavioral uh, intervention trials. Uh, and so um, that was uh, what I wanted to, to move into next. And I, I, I suspect that some of you in the audience uh, are in this camp as well. So this was one of my first clinical trials, which was a randomized clinical trial here in Baltimore, where we actually used a factorial design and randomly assigned clinicians. And then uh, among the clinicians, we randomly assigned their patients. So the clinicians, clinicians were randomized to receive computer-based communication skills training, uh, focused on being more patient-centered uh, in their style with uh, minority patients and those with lower income. And then, uh, or, or the, the, you know, the less intensive group basically just got a copy of hypertension guidelines because uh, this study was being done in patients with uncontrolled hypertension. And then um, the patients of these clinicians were randomly assigned to be coached by a community health worker who would help them become more actively involved in decision-making around their hypertension care. Or they would, the patients who got the less intensive intervention basically got a monthly, um, a monthly newsletter. 
So what we found is that patients who were coached and whose doctors had communication skills training showed greater improvements in their communication, their participation in decisions, and also in their blood pressure levels. And so it was encouraging. And one of the reasons we had done used this approach was because we have found that previous literature had showed that if you just intervene with clinicians alone, that you actually don't really show much improvement in patient outcomes. But what was new about this study was that um, community health workers are really sort of culturally um, appropriate uh, way of, of extending reach uh, of health care to underserved populations and making it more culturally appropriate and more structurally appropriate because these interventionists usually come from the neighborhoods um, that are being served and have a great understanding of the context. And so uh, this was unique in that there had been activation studies for patients before. Many of them had not really focused on, on African-Americans or patients with low income. And, um, and none had actually used community health workers at, as coaches. So, um, but quickly it became apparent that, you know, okay, we could show improvements in a clinical trial uh, that had 300 patients in it, but how are we actually gonna make this happen on a larger scale, and it became clear that you know we were building a, a very large knowledge base, and the disparities field has really grown. There's a lot of knowledge now about the epidemiology of health disparities. Uh, this is not to say that we we still don't need uh, other studies, but um, there was quite a bit of knowledge that had been grown up about that. Some basic biomedical uh, work around things like allostatic load, for example, and um, you know the importance of, of potassium in in uh, diets for people with hypertension. Um, but uh, a lot of this work was ac actually not leading to, uh, to improvements in population health. And so, you know, scientists, policymakers began to really start to realize that we needed to do more than just um, learn uh, to just have knowledge, but we really needed to really bring people from across multiple disciplines together we really needed to do a better job of engaging with multiple stakeholders at all these different levels of influence and really begin to focus on how we could build sustainability of these interventions, how we could disseminate and translate some of these findings. So, um, so you know, we all think that, well, if we knew all these things, why couldn't we get them done? And one of the reasons why is because they're so complex. It is it's such a complex problem. So. This framework actually comes from um, a paper that uh, my colleague Tangela Purnell and I worked on together where we uh, described, um, uh, we provided a model and we also described some gaps in the evidence focused on the healthcare setting, um, interventions involving the healthcare setting to address disparities in cardiovascular disease and cancer. And so we showed uh, using this model, which is, is modified from a model developed by Fisher et al. Um, that, you know, in order to have an impact on health equity, you have to, to have intervention targets at more than one of these levels. You know, what we saw was that interventions that only targeted one level or even two levels were less likely to be uh, effective at uh, achieving health equity than those that intervened upon two or more levels. So we provided this framework so that people could see, you know, what, what are the types of intervention targets that exists at each level. What key healthcare processes do they um, influence? You know, who are all these different stakeholders within the healthcare setting um, that we want to influence their um, the, the interactions on? And then looked at a whole variety of different outcomes. So not just clinical outcomes, but which are ultimately what a lot of people care about, but also things that are also important to the healthcare system, like avoidable hospital admissions a use of healthcare services costs, and then of course, patient experiences. So one of the things we did, and I don't expect you to read this entire slide, was that we identified 15 major knowledge and translation gaps. And we said, um, we found where they existed. In some cases, the, the gaps existed only at one level, but there were some gaps that existed across all levels. And one of the gaps that existed across all levels when we you know, did this, this review of the literature was that many studies did not incorporate broad stakeholder engagement in intervention development, testing, and dissemination. 
And many studies didn't look to see whether multi-level interventions were more effective than those targeting a single level. Um, there were several uh, uh, interventions that actually used a universal approach. And um, it, it was unclear to us whether by doing that, what we do, what we do is just perpetuate inequities or make them worse, or whether there's need to be more targeted approaches. So that's a question that uh, still needs to be answered. And then uh, very few studies actually described the implementation challenges. Um, and so um, that, that, that could explain why we still have this gap in implementation. So again, lots of uh, gaps and lots of work to be done. And this is just one uh, domain and uh, one set of issues, one set of uh, healthcare issues and health issues. So, you know, to do this, you know, we've, we've been using implementation science, which is again, a, a, a growing field, which is, includes methods to promote integration of research findings into healthcare policy and practice. And so it's all about understanding the behaviors of people within the organization or people who have influence on the organization as uh, key variables in whether there's sustainable uptake and implementation of these interventions. So it really seeks to look at these different factors, to look at what, uh, which, how they relate to one another, and then um, and to use that sort of to inform uh, approaches moving forward, and draws upon um, many of the other um, domain, the other disciplines such as social epidemiology, clinical trials, um, health services research as well. But then, you know, we also draw very strongly upon uh, another type of research called community-based participatory research, you know, which is a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all the partners in the research process. So, you know, we traditionally as scientists will come up with a question that we think is interesting, you know, after reviewing the literature or, you know, talking with colleagues or experts in our field and decide that we're going to do a study but that may not necessarily be the topic that is of critical importance to the community we're studying. So with CBPR, it sort of flips that the other way. Um, the research questions are informed by the people who are impacted by the problem. And they are very much engaged in, in developing the questions and in, in determining what methods should be used um, to study it. You know, so there's bi-directional learning. You know, they're not all scientists, but we can talk to them and we can explain to them uh, what, what it would take to answer the kinds of questions they have and ask them whether they think that would be something acceptable uh, to their uh, family members and friends or um, the, the clients they serve. So we work very closely with a community uh, advisory board. This is a photo, one of our recent uh, holiday photos that we took a few years ago. And um, we really draw upon very strong relationship-centered principles. So this definition of CBPR, community-based research, comes from the Kellogg Community Scholars Program. But the research building uh, principles, uh, the re relationship building principles, I'm sorry, um, uh, have, I've drawn upon those from a lot of my work in, um, on the doctor-patient relationship and actually learned about how you can actually apply this to the researcher uh, community uh, relationship. So we really um, focus on respect for diverse perspectives, partnership in decision making, uh, very clear and regular communication, trustworthiness. We have to, you know, do what we say we're going to do, um, be who we say we are, um, uh, seek to always understand um, one another. We're not always going to agree on everything but to be respectful of that and um, to, to always have a good intent. And then we seek concordance. Where is it that we have uh, commonality in our values and perspectives and build upon concordance? So um, this is uh, just the mission for the Center for Health Equity, uh, where we promote equity and health for socially at risk populations through our scientific knowledge base, uh, advancing that through research through education and training and through partnership with communities uh, through raising public awareness and promoting sustainable changes in practice and policy. This, this was a more recent photo uh, from last year, um, wishing for a healing health, peace and justice in 2020. Little did we know how much we were really going to need that. <laughs> So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details on the, the 
the slides because I want to make sure we have time for questions. But um, we did for the first five years of the center uh, conduct three uh, different types of intervention trials, all multi-level. And one of them was more based in the healthcare system, Project Redship. One was more based on addressing um, food availability uh, for patients living in food deserts uh, with uh, uncontrolled hypertension, the five plus nuts and beans trial, and also provided an, uh, an income supplement so that people could purchase healthier food. And then another one uh, was focused on different ways of activating patients, com comparing uh, problem solving techniques to one that actually used community health workers and um, to one that um, was more of a coaching model to see which of those was actually um, more desirable because you know, our community advisory board actually gave us advice about how to shape these questions. For example, the whole, the income supplement in the five plus nuts and beans study, the study was initially designed to provide one group with uh, the income supplement and the dietary coaching and the other group would just get a pamphlet. And the community advisory board said, that's not acceptable. Um, you know, we don't think people are going to want to sign up for a study knowing that they might get assigned to the group where they get nothing, whereas the other group, nothing except a pamphlet and the other group gets everything. And so the study design was changed so that everyone in the trial got the income supplement, which was $30 a week, um, which is actually the, the uh, food allowance, um, the, you know, that SNAP, uh, SNAP benefits that people with low income get, believe it or not, to, to, to eat uh, per week. Uh, actually to feed their a whole family of four. Um, and so um, everyone got the food, the, the income supplement, and, and then the other, the experimental group additionally got the dietary coaching uh, and assistance with ordering their, their groceries. And so then the research question became not, um, it, was, it was clear for us to see that, is it just an income supplement that people who live in a food desert need? or do they need more than that in order to achieve their goals? And we did show you know, improvements in, in dietary habits. And um, although the study didn't really show significant improvements in blood pressure control, that gave us some ideas about what we needed to work on next. So I'll tell you more about you know, what we've learned, but uh, we've, the, the center then evolved and you can see that we're still doing our engagement, our research and our training. Um, our three trials now are the Rich Life Trial, um, Pragmatic Cluster Randomized Trial across two states, enrolled uh, approximately 1,900 patients, uh, working, looking at whether community health workers working in partnership with nurse care managers uh, can actually help to address patients' social needs uh, more appropriately in patients, uh, disadvantaged patients with hypertension. Um, and then also access to remote specialist consultation. So this trial is designed so that it's a stepped care process so that people who don't need anything more than a care manager get that. But if people need more than that, they, depending on what their needs are, they can get a community health worker to help with issues like, for example, transportation or signing up for health insurance or um, you know, other issues that they might need help with that aren't really health specific, but are nevertheless getting in the way of them um, being healthy. So things like even signing up for um, unemployment or for, um, for food uh, benefits. Um, so we're going to be uh, following those people for 24 months. Uh, the five plus nuts and beans for kidneys trial um, uh, being led by uh, Dr. Deidre Cruz and uh, Dr. Pete Miller is a two arm randomized control trial. And this time we're focusing doing the same very same intervention that we did before with the income supplement and the dietary coaching, but now focused on a more high risk group because these are individuals who have early kidney disease. And even if, um, if we are able to show even minor improvements in blood pressure control in this group, that could lead to uh, a slowing of the decline in their kidney function. So we're looking for that. And then we also have a trial uh, that's going on in Ghana that's using some lessons learned from from here uh, on uh, blood pressure self-monitoring and use of mobile health technology to uh, overcome some, some barriers uh, of access to primary care and also using community health nurses. So we have those three trials going on. We continue our engagement with our community advisory board and our health system partners. We also work with lo local and 
national and global policymakers to, to tell them, share our knowledge with them about what's effective and to advocate for changes in policy. And we have a very robust uh, training program uh, led by Dr. Tangela Purnell. Um, she and I co-teach a, a couple of courses in the School of Public Health. We have a monthly health equity jam session that we encourage you to attend along with your trainees and then also individualized training opportunities for uh, our students. So these are just some photos of our community advisory board uh, members, um, not to belabor, I think I've told you already, but we have uh, um, over 60 members. Um, and some of the lessons we've learned is that multi-level uh, interventions are a promising strategy to reduce cardiovascular health disparities, but there's still several remaining challenges that need to be addressed. One of them is increasing the reach of interventions. And that's one of the reasons for this important need for stakeholder engagement. Leaders of community-based organizations, um, community activists, people like that really know what it takes to, to reach uh, difficult to reach populations. So, you know, trying to do everything from within the healthcare system has, has been challenging. And even with the use of community health workers. So, we still need to increase reach of interventions. Um, mobile technology may be something that could be helpful, but again, that could worsen uh, disparities with the digital divide. So we're gonna have to study those things too, especially in the era of COVID. Uh, we need to do a better job of addressing patients' economic barriers, tailoring the interventions to the context and the person, really trying to prioritize the priorities of these different uh, stakeholders, uh, everybody, wants a good outcome, but there are lots of other uh, like different incentives operating for different groups within the healthcare system, within the community, uh, among practitioners, among researchers. So really working across all of those, uh, demonstrating cost effectiveness, looking to see uh, if we have intervention durability and sustainability, and then really having funding for community engagement and dissemination, uh, oftentimes it, that is a, a, a limitation. And fortunately, we have a very committed people that are willing to remain engaged whether or not there's a lot of funding. So I think what's most important is actually the commitment. So I'm going to finish up with, because uh, I know you all are gonna be talking about COVID and um, clearly, you know, our big concern is the disparities that have been really magnified during this time among our people of color, communities of color having um, one to two times higher uh, rates of ex uh, infections with COVID, almost four times as high uh, the rate of hospitalizations as whites, and uh, two to three times the, the death, the rates of death from COVID-19. Where we have our map meeting, I just, we heard from- So let's see, I think someone's got themselves on. So, um, you know, one of the things, Josh Sharfstein and I actually wrote this um, op-ed for Politico and because they were asking at the, early in the pandemic, what can um, policymakers do to make a game plan to, to address the most vulnerable during this time? And these are the five things that we suggested. Uh, I just wanna make sure you see that we suggested data, tracking data uh, by race, ethnicity and geography as a very, uh, a, high priority because as you know, you can't do anything about, about a problem if you don't know what it is or where it is or who has it. And so that was one of the critical pieces of the things we recommended along with communicating and building trust with communities of color, enhancing access to testing and healthcare. And now of course, vaccines, um, protecting essential and low wage workers and providing social services. Um, so um, I'm gonna wrap up with a couple of editorials that I've been um, involved in, in writing, one of them on this call for a different kind of herd immunity. So we all know that we've been told that we need to flatten the curve on this uh, pandemic, but you know it's going to take more than uh, short-term investment. In order to do that, we can't just tell people to put on masks and stay home. Not everyone is going to have the luxury of doing that. So we're gonna have to have long-term systematic, comprehensive, and coordinated investments in addressing social determinants of health and structural determinants of health in our society. Um, really focusing on making sure that people have safe housing, have adequate food, have uh, jobs, and have uh, insurance and healthcare. And so 
And we've seen how failure to protect the most vulnerable not only harms them, but has also increased the spread of infection across the country and really uh, impacted uh, you know, social relationships, um, led to civil unrest and to economic um, hardship. And that the resistance of this spread of poor health will only occur when we have a sufficiently high proportion of our society that's protected from negative social factors. So we were calling for a different kind of herd immunity um, in this editorial. And then this one, focusing on all the excess deaths, there have been more than 400,000 excess deaths in the US in 2020. Uh, clearly these implications are sobering for all of us, but even more profound for communities of color. Communities of color have grieved excess deaths for generations. Uh, most people who come from communities of color experience the death of an immediate family member at much younger ages and at much higher rates than uh, the rest of the population, leading to what we call community bereavement. So there's ongoing harm. As we all know, there's been structural racism that has existed for a very long time. There's the economic fallout now, the epidemic of police violence um, this past year, and in the last, actually for a very long time, just magnified more recently. So it's really time for a national reawakening and an implementation of a plan for restorative justice. And so um, these are some of the strategies that uh, NIMHD has recommended as well for advancement of health disparity science. They've classified them into these three groups, into um, methods and measurement, etiology and interventions. So I encourage you to go to their website um, and they'll give you some really granular suggestions. There are about 30 um, specific uh, recommendations that are in there. And, um, and then I'll just close with sort of an overarching um, statement about what I think is a bold new vision for health disparities intervention research. And this was uh, written with in, in collaboration with the directors of the 10 Centers for Population Health and Health Disparities that were funded by NIH back in 2010. And what we said is that first, we need to reframe health disparities and health inequities discussions for positive influence. People need to understand that these factors are shaped by society and decisions that we have made uh, that have led to inequities and opportunities and that these are not um, the result of simply the result of individuals making poor uh, behavioral choices. Uh, we need to design and evaluate rigorous multi-level interventions. We need to use a social determinants framework for our interventions and a health in all policies approach to uh, evaluations of our policies that, that are directed at social factors. We need to really focus on improving researchers' communication, cultural and structural competencies, and uh, so the importance of the training cannot be uh, overemphasized. We need to dismantle drivers of stigmatization and discrimination. Um, and a lot of that will be focused, uh, will be social and behavioral research focused on uh, understanding how we change uh, group behavior and uh, uh, individual behaviors and attitudes. We need to prioritize community engagement and equitably shared power and foster transdisciplinary collaborations. So if we do that, um, and we know that, that equality is not equity, one size will not fit all. And it doesn't mean that, um, that it's not fair. It means that we need to do give to each according to need. Um, and then when we do that, we will be embracing our vision of health equity, which is when every person will have the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. And we can't do it alone. So if we want to go fast, we can go alone. But if we want to go far, we need to go together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for that uh, wonderful talk and you know, very illuminating, particularly for those of us who really don't think in this space very often. It, it really is helpful to understand the framework. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if I can kind of take uh, just a quick minute. I, I had one question for you that uh, comes, you know, largely because of my background, which is throughout the entire talk, uh, I didn't hear you talk at all about the impact of technology and health disparities. And, and particularly during COVID, obviously, we've seen medicine uh, transition to telehealth, or, you know, uh, just a lot of changes that have been pushed by uh, the 
the need to still take care of people in this unusual time. Is, is technology at all a factor in this or is that really a, a, a side issue to, to the other major issues of health equity? Yeah, so I, I actually did mention technology, but probably because I was talking about so many things, it maybe got lost uh, in the translation. So no, I think technology is important and I think it's actually grown in importance uh, with the pandemic. So, um, you know, we've been using technology to try to address disparities we, as we are doing with that project in Ghana with the mobile uh, phone technology, using apps, using uh, self-monitoring uh, where people can communicate with, with their uh, healthcare providers virtually. Um, and we know that technology actually is something that even despite what we have read about the digital divide, you know, there's data showing that in fact, African-Americans are just as likely to own a cell phone as uh, other ethnic groups and, and Hispanics, you know, as well. And that, that many uh, ethnic minority groups actually use their phones and use apps for health information, uh, even at higher rates than, than other groups. So I think there's a lot of potential for technology to be used. Um, we are looking right now in the Johns Hopkins Health System, for example, at access uh, because there have been some concerns um, that um, because of lack of access to either uh, computers or to broadband uh, connectivity that people will have, you know, less access to healthcare during the this time when many of the visits have moved to, to uh, telemedicine visits. We are seeing lower rates of use of visual visits by um, underserved communities, by people of color. Um, we are seeing that they are using phone, telephone technology. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what we can do to work with, um, in, in partnership with the tech industry as well and with you know, also policymakers about in making sure that the access is there uh, for individuals because clearly there's an interest in using the technology and, and willingness and acceptance of it among large groups of, of health disparity populations. So I think there's, there's a lot of potential for that there. We know a lot of uh, communities of color, people do use social media to communicate and um, to uh, engage in, in the social uh, environment and in to engage in the political process and it's been highly effective. So I think there's a lot of promise there. And uh, I have a lot of young younger colleagues who are, are focusing on this work, including um, Yvonne Commodore Menza in the School of Nursing and also Tangela Purnell in the Department of Epidemiology. Excellent, thank you. Um, other questions? Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a question. Uh, uh, Dr. Cooper, thank you so much for a very illuminating talk uh, and for agreeing to speak at our event. Um, uh, you, you've, much of your talk was spent uh, discussing the importance of sort of careful study design uh, and uh, with the goal of sort of reducing disparities. And uh, so I'm going to be speaking later about uh, sort of understanding mechanisms specifically like explanations for disparities. And I just was wondering if you could speak a bit to the role the study design plays in that and whether uh, there's been some work on that specifically in the context of COVID. I mean, for, for my, speaking for myself, I'm just using trying to use observational data, but I understand that really study design is going to be key for this question. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of work that's being done, um, you know, all kinds of sophisticated techniques um, from, you know, social epidemiology, um, using um, geospatial analysis, mm -hmm. um, all kinds of different techniques being uh, used to look at different contributors uh, within the, the physical environment, within the social environment. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of a very important role for using existing data um, and uh, also for you know, collection of, of data, using data from you know, cohorts or uh, you know, health system data or other data that are collected um, you know, from, for example, the public sector. Um, all of that kind of information is gonna be really important. And that's why I think these partnerships uh, between research and these groups is important because in a lot of cases, these, there are data, maybe they're not being optimally collected, but I think researchers can be very innovative and creative about how to use that information to better understand these phenomena. And I think even modeling, um, uh, research that uses uh, different kinds of modeling can be helpful to sort of try to get a handle on whether different approaches might 
uh, lead to um, uh, reductions in disparities than in others. So yeah, I think there's a lot of room for that and um, you know, the need to really uh, for, you know, for the purposes of like making, taking advantage of existing resources, uh, really critically important work to be done. What are, uh, what social determinants of health are thought to be the main drivers here? Like, is this, is this sort of an active area of research right now? Or well, is yeah. it biology or yeah. what is it? Well, you know, I mean, I wish I could tell you it was one thing, you know, I think it okay. depends on where you are and which group you're studying. And, you know, it's even, I mean, differences in maternal mortality, for example, um, racial differences, differences in maternal mortality are influenced by a number of different things like the, you know, geographic access and all of those things. A lot of the studies that have been done have looked to see to what extent they could account for these differences and have found that for the most part in that particular problem that provider behavior and implicit bias is playing a huge role. And so that's where the focus is gonna be on, on for interventions, but that doesn't mean that the other factors will be ignored because they sort of all play into with one another. You know, So for example, even the problem of hypertension disparities where you know, we found these differences in communication, but then we also found that you know, some of it had to do with the staffing within the clinics and that the fact that there weren't enough staff and that that you know providers were having to see patients like so rapidly that they didn't have time to do the the needs assessments that needed to be done to address social needs so the need to introduce other staff to be able to do that and you know to to actually like give people resources like where can they be referred to otherwise the, there's no incentive to uncover a huge problem that a patient's facing if you have nothing to do to offer to help them with it, right? So mm -hmm. I think, I wish I could give you one answer, but it, it's going to depend on who you're studying, what condition you're studying, where you're studying it, you know. There, there are some patterns, certainly, you know, but, like um, <laughs> but yeah, one size does not fit all. Yeah. Great, we probably have time for maybe one more quick question, if there's any other. Questions out there? Show I was really here. I was um, wondering if you could, first off, thank you for such a fantastic talk. I learned a ton. I'm helping her. Um, I was one. I think someone's unmuted. Um, maybe if everyone could just mute themselves. So I was wondering, you mentioned the importance of place and community and considering that when doing research and interventions. I was wondering if you could speak and educate us a little bit on how we're doing in the Baltimore community, given the, if you could speak a little bit about the history with trust and the healthcare system um, in our community and how the vaccine for COVID um, is both being distributed and uh, studied and how our, our community is accepting all of that. And I'm sure your team is looking into some aspects of that or if you've read anything about how we're doing. Right. Well, you know, I think we have the same concerns that a lot of people around the country have. There is more uh, skepticism about the vaccine uh, in communities of color, including in Baltimore, you know, around um, how rapidly the studies were done and um, the whole issue of, you know, the question of, is this another, time when uh, people of color are going to be exploited or experimented upon because that's happened before, um, you know, or that, you know, someone's trying to make money um, off of doing this. Uh, a lot of conspiracy theories circulating um, around what, what the vaccine is going to, to do to people, whether it's going to change their DNA and whether, um, it's there's some sort of microchip implanted into it by Bill Gates that's going to you know be used for to you know track people's comings and goings. So I think there are a lot of myths circulating. I do think that there we have a lot of engaged community partners who are working um, on some of the national network trials, working with a network called CoVPN um, that you know, that are very strong supporters of, of people in communities of color being vaccinated. And so, you know, people from faith communities also 
working to learn more about the scientific process and about vaccines and to um, make sure that information gets out to people so that they can make an informed decision for themselves. But you know, as you can, as you've articulated, there there are some challenges that we are going to face that you know are well earned and that we are going to have to 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 build that trust and make ourselves trustworthy to people and also not be clear that we need to be respectful about this. Um, we need to be um, transparent about what we know and what we don't know about the vaccines and they, the way they work and how safe they are and allow people to make their own decisions and not feel that we are um, imposing our will or that we have some sort of secondary agenda that we are um, trying to carry out. So yeah, we have we have challenges still, but there are a lot of people working on it. Great, thank you. Any final questions? All right, hearing only crickets. Uh, Dr. Cooper, thank you so much for your time and for uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, and um, good luck with all the work that you're doing. It, it's super important. Sure, good luck to all of you. And um, it sounds looks like you have a great program. So I look forward to hearing all about what, uh, what you are doing and what you come up with. Great, thank you. All right, with that,